Growth brings wisdom. Our intellectual, emotional, moral and spiritual foundations determine what we can receive. Boom! What's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host Alan Sakian. Super excited to be talking about ancient wisdom in modern times. We have Niles Heckman joining us on the show. Hello. Pleasure to be with you, sir. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. I'm really excited for this episode. Niles' background, he's a documentarian whose personal work focuses on themes of ancient wisdom. And the links in the bio to NilesHeckman.com as well as TransmutationFilm.com and ShamansOfTheGlobalVillage.com, which we will be unpacking here. That was a short excerpt from Transmutation Film. I'm excited to be talking about that and documentarian work in general. Let's start things off with one of our favorite questions to ask our guest, Niles. Mm. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? I think a lot of the species seems to be de-evolving and then a smaller percentage seems to be in a brilliant point of evolution. And that seems like what 2012 is about, right? Like the argument of larger metaphysical things going on from Pisces to Aquarius of like the species finally waking up to some extent. And you have, you could argue there's the hundredth monkey scenario which some people talk about where a smaller, more sophisticated and enlightened group of people understand more underrooted things about what's secretly really going on and a larger mass is asleep still. So I know as you have a show called Simulation, much of that maybe focuses around themes, a theme that's similar to some, what some of my work focuses on, which is a Gnostic mindset of like this reality being illusory and how much people really realize that what's really going on is different than what is proposed by the mainstream reality tunnel. Or what I would say is the, main, the joker spirals of the mainstream unreality signal. Right, so that's kind of a dynamic where you see a lot of people that are what's called being on a latent path, you know, just going sideways, or on a descendant path if they're in some sort of personal destruction, doing, you know, methamphetamine in the civic center over here, or like, you know, incarcerated or selling, you know, some sort of narcotic on the street, doing a life of crime that's descendant. There's most people are on a latent path, they're just kind of going sideways, even if they have, you know, a Stanford degree and three PhDs, they might just be doing their job and their routine and doing kids and work, kids and work and they're just latently doing things. But then a smaller percentage of people are doing more excellent things on an ascendant path where they're trying to be in a constant point of betterment and discovery. So I think as we kind of start in that process or the whole species slowly moves in that process or at least a smaller percentage of people do, we can see that we find the others that are doing excellent things as well. And you know, we all can only do our little part, but as long as you're trying to always be in some level of betterment or discovery, you get my vote. For sure. <laughs> and then what would you say are some of the key things that those that are on the, um, this ascendant path of, of self-work and discovery and transcendence and helping the collective as well, doing focus on that, what can they best do to help awaken others to that realization of this, and you use the word Gnosticism. Yeah, yes. Gnostic spirituality. Yeah, yeah, teach us about that. And, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, well, I'm a, I'm a documentary filmmaker, or at least I feel like I'm half amateur, half professional at what I do. But you could put this word to the forefront that my work focuses around themes of spirituality. Most people, that's such a loaded term, and like Sturgeon's Law says 90% of everything's crap. So just like with spirituality, there's a lot of bad spirituality out there. So I don't necessarily put spirituality to the forefront. I would say that my work combines essentially occult and esoteric content with high production value. Most people don't also know what occult or esoteric mean. So an even more down in the weeds way of saying what I do is my work focuses on themes of mysticism, alchemy, hermetic philosophy, shamanism, or maybe something like Gnosticism, right? These are ancient spiritual philosophic practices. Most people don't know what those are. So another zoom out from that is I could just say that my work focuses on themes of ancient wisdom or ancient knowledge combined with my background of having high production values. You know, So it's like you create something that looks good, has the professionalism behind it, and then you actually have an underlying thing to say. And so something when you insert something like Gnosticism into something, even famous works like The Matrix, and I worked on The Matrix sequels as a young sprout, you know, people don't know about that or they don't understand it, but they can still heartstring feel into it, feel that there's some sort of underlying things that speaks to their, what you could argue is their subconscious or their deeper self. So when you insert wisdom into things or any of these ancient practices that have huge power in them, I think that there's a lot of reward in that, for sure. So that's what I kind of always try and do in ever so slight ways with my life and my work and how I intrinsically am and what exteriorly manifests in my works, right? Like how we internally li yeah. live our life, our spiritual life, which if you want to 
put spiritual to the forefront, a good way that I always try and say it is that spiritual just essentially means truthful, right? It's just how you truthfully live your life and how you try and be on some sort of ascendant way of being or betterment or else expansion, right? Like everything you try and do, you try and be expansive in. So you try and, you know, are conscious about everything that you do. You're conscious about how you, what you put in your body, how you live your life, who you associate with, who you interact with. You're not doing contractive things. You're not, you know, watching the sporting event at the pub, even though we all might do that here and there. But there's all the traps of the illusions of the mainstream unreality joker spiral signal always wants you to do contractive things. And I try and insert something ever so slightly that does expand, that provides media that is expansive, just like you might be trying to do with the show, right? Yes. Where you're trying to have more conscious conversations and you've created a platform per, where people can talk about real shit. <laughs> That's right, yeah. So your, so your essence with the documentary work is to disseminate um, high quality productions of ancient wisdom that can awaken and inspire people. Yeah, or like the way to say it is that for those with ears to hear, because you can't wake yeah. anybody up that doesn't want to be woken up. That's a classic Gnostic theme. With those right? willing to hear. With them. Yeah, it's yeah. eyes to see and ears to hear is one way of looking at it. And I'm, I'm not any... I don't present myself as a scholar or anything. I'm just a student of life and student of these ancient Likewise. practices, right? Likewise. And so it's like yeah. the big failure of like the guru or the somebody that's allowing themselves to be elevated is to say like, I'm claiming more than I really am. So when you're just saying I'm learning and I'm on a path of betterment, I'm not trying to preach anything, but yes. when you start talking about something like esotericism, which is such a personal path and it's such a path of inner understanding and your own gnosis and your own wisdom through whatever way that came, um, it is very contagious because you can present yourself of a way of being and living and acting in the world that reflects onto other people and they just read that. They read your geometry in you as, yeah. as doing something excellent, right? You yeah. don't have to stand on some soapbox and preach things that are very dogmatic in old fashioned ways. Yeah, yeah and that's, yeah. that's what I'm always doing is as my life has changed and bettered and I've understood deeper things that have brought me gnosis or insight or experience, the works also reflect that. So it's like my life hopefully reflects that ever so slightly and the works do as well. And that's why, you know, I see a lot of content online these days. A lot of it's visually beautiful, but it has little to nothing to say. It's all this base chakra stuff. So when you can kind of try and make something that's a higher vibrational energy, which we could sound a little woo-woo, but ultimately everything is energetic. When you start putting out that signal, you know, people respond to it a bit. Even though you're sometimes, it feels like you're speaking to smaller, again, groups of more sophisticated and enlightened people. There's channels now that allow us to bypass these gatekeepers and get more authentic stuff to the forefront. So you've created something yourself here with this show that is also, we have a similarity of what we're doing, trying to just do our own thing and be our authentic selves, follow our own ways of being and acting that yes. reflect in our outward manifestations. So, yes, yes, yeah. thank you. And who were you <clears throat> growing up that got you interested in documentary work? Yeah, you know, it was interesting. I was always a kid that like liked cinema in my past in my more stupid past when i didn't know anything growing up i a lot of everything was a reflection on a movie like the movies teach us things later in life as i came to work in hollywood and realized it was a place that had some decent things about it but like sturgeon's law everything of 90 percent of everything is crap so 90 percent of what goes on in hollywood is very you know naughty not in your best interest like just like anything from standard operating procedure of capitalism or Wall Street. There's deep levels of dark sorcery that are so very soul sucking in these places. And people get into these systems of you know, shadow workings within the music industry and realize that they essentially have to do these dark things to sustain some level of fame and fortune or red carpet champagne dreams. And there's, it's beautiful to have an, a reach and have people like your material and know your stuff. And I'm certainly, as any artist, I'm no different than the standard artist that wants to have their work be known. So it's nice to, to share what you're doing, but you ultimately come to realize that these things aren't in your best interest. And you might be able to somewhat balance working in them, right? But I, I came to realize that any client work I ever did was significantly less interesting than the work I would create myself because I was essentially too conscious for that industry, right? It's like, we were always having a conversation <laughs> yeah. with you know, Ron about this, about you, know, you get yeah. to the point where you can't really operate in the old way of being. Yep. So as I was growing up, I got into Hollywood and I saw what it did well and what it did not well and I have a lot of respect for certain people within the industry and I know people within the industry that are trying to do decent things but then getting content that's any, anything expansive past these gatekeepers is very difficult, <laughs> right? So every once in a while you will see a gem, right? You will see something like The Matrix, you know, that has some sort yeah. of actual wisdom in it. I, I worked on Avatar in my 
more stupid paths when I didn't know anything and made a lot of money. And now, as I know things, you know, there's new streams of revenue beginning and creating my own content. But something like Avatar has very shamanic themes. And people don't know that, but they, it resonates mm -hmm. with people, right? So we do see things coming out of <coughs> large, big budget projects that at times are pretty good. So I give credit when I am occasionally watching something that is like, oh, this is great. I'm really happy that this was made. And it's not a piece of dark sorcery that's just there to be an op or some sort of something that's giving a misrepresentation of what it is to actually be a real human being and be on a path of betterment and discovery. It's just distraction and illusion. And we see that so much with entertainment industries. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna get to the, the that distraction <laughs> illusion side of things too. I wanna, were you ever, when you were younger, were you ever um, just the first moments with cameras just got really excited about it or were the first moments with spiritual growth yourself got really excited? No, I, I became much more, I guess, as I referenced 2012, 2012 was a big year where things kind of clicked for me. You know, so I would say I was well into my 20s in my more, again, stupid past, not knowing anything, where before I really kind of started to understand things. And I had had an interest in kind of more off the beaten path things, right? I liked Garbage Bell Kids more than something more mainstream, right? So esotericism is such an inner thing, and it's about those that are kind of outsiders and rejects. So as somebody, the young kid rebels against the mainstream, leave it to beaver, you know, materialist rubbish culture of white picket fence, suburban hellish America. You know, you're into punk music or something like that, or you're into skater culture. You're into these aspects that are rebellious natures of the, you know, joker spirals of unreality and just delusion and distraction that don't benefit us as conscious, conscious excellent beings. So I think we do have these avenues that we go down that are different. And I did find my path in, you know, occasionally reading excellent things that were, had actual wisdom in them, or seeing something that was a more off the beaten path piece of graphic novel. You know, I loved Alan Moore's graphic novels, that type of thing, where there's actually like occult themes in these things. So there was pieces of art that really did inspire. And then as I got into my 20s, I really started to, things clicked and I really started to become on more of a path of, of excellence through various experiences and spiritual practices, right? Through having a meditative practice, through okay. various okay. experiences that, you know, would give us some sort of gnosis or logos. And that's just fractaled out from there and the projects that are I've created into my 30s. What would be a recommendation mm -hmm. that you would have for those that are, uh, ha are developing the eyes and the ears to, to see that there's more to life than the Joker spirals? Yeah. Like, where can they find signal? How can they parse for the signal? It's, very, it's, it's an important question because it's so hard to find real content. And a lot of excellent stuff isn't even on the internet. And as we know, like big anything, I sometimes and I often in conversations use this phrase where like big anything lowers human consciousness, right? So to piss everybody off, I say like big corporations, big government, big science, big religion. Obviously, if you're operating within these things in a more like grassroots level, you're probably going to go after truth. You know, if you're okay. if you're operating in some way where you're like an actual real excellent, you know, you have a little church in a small community and you're actually saying things that are more Gnostic themes of actual real esoteric Christianity, you might be searching out excellence. Or if you're operating, if you're a small business owner, you know, you might be doing things that are, it's nice to support the local community. But as things get so big, there's no wisdom in them. They're just about the dollar signs and maintaining the status quo. Damn. So it's hard to go into big tech and find wisdom on areas of, you know, Facebook or these dis delusions of Twitter and, and YouTube. But we do find things that are excellent. And big tech is very much purging things that aren't necessarily expansive. So one way that I would say is study the specific life work of people. You know, seek out people's works who are excellent. You know, and usually you find somebody's works that really fractal you out and make you realize bigger things, and then that bounces you off to somebody else, right? So you find Robert Anton Wilson's material, you read a book by Robert Anton Wilson, and they are talking about Terence McKenna, and they lead you to somebody like Alan Watts. Yes. So you find these specific individuals who actually Sweet. started to know things and, and talk about things, and they reference other people. And then that's very much how, in terms of my dis studies, I always do it. And I have a list of people that are actually like, I call them the people that knew things list of people. And they're, it's always growing, and it's always improving, because I'm always myself finding new people that knew things. But most people on a latent path in our society, all they know how to do is essentially be in their little sliver of commerce, which is fine. You know, commerce restricts, is commerce is another whole thing that we could talk about, but human beings are not commercial traders. So we're not meant to just go to our shit jobs every day. And that's yeah, yeah, all that yeah, we do yeah, until yeah. we hit the golf course at 60. You know, yeah, there's yeah. much more to life than that. So it's great if you like what you do and it gives you time and space for your own practices. But ultimately, that's only going to come from your own, you know, own direction. And that's certainly what I found is that 
as I create works that are, I learn from creating them, just like you learn from the conversations you have on this thing, it becomes this spiral that feeds itself. There's a right? lot of you, notes from this conversation yeah. so far. You're crushing it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm, and I'm, I try not to be too long-winded. I could happily talk for 14 minutes, so yeah, I'll, you, I'll wrap you, up there. You're <laughs> crushing it. Um, so I like how you said that one of the ways out of the Joker spirals and distraction um, uh, to find the signal is to seek out people's life works. Yeah. And then to kind of do like you're starting to follow a signal trail between yeah. people. Why is it that there is a, the, one of the people that I admire is sitting down with this person. Why is it yeah. about this person? Yeah. So then you look into that person. Yes. And okay, and that's how you can maybe start digging out. Also, I really appreciate how you said like big anything is actually restrictive, uh, restrictive, and contractive, contractive. Yeah. Like uh, a lot of it is that um, the family values don't scale. So like my, yeah. my tendency to self deal as Google or Facebook is just more likely than my tendency to be like, I care about Niles Heckman and Ron Vargas. Yeah. And so I'm going to do things that, that show that I specifically am tailoring my algorithms to something that's gonna benefit their health and their yes. wellness and all this type of stuff yeah. rather than their time on screen type style. So yeah, that, that was also a very good point. Um, okay, so let's, Let's launch into um, the, the ancient wisdom within the actual, so let's start with transmutation, sure. where we watched yeah. the very short um, clip that we watched at the beginning. So um, teach us about this film mm -hmm. and what you're doing with the ancient wisdom in it. Yeah, I mean, transmutation is a feature doc that we made completely independently. You know, it's very rare to find a truly independent film. And so it's essentially about the beauty and danger of a hidden spiritual path and shows people that have transformed themselves, which is really transmute themselves by walking it, right? So alchemy, a secret to alchemy is the transmutation of oneself. Esoterically, ancient alchemy, you could say, is a precursor to chemistry, right? And the, the, the stereotype of alchemy is that, you know, in ancient days, they were just trying to turn lead to gold, right? They were being very materialistic about it. <clears throat> a deeper way of looking at that Again, the inner core of something will be this esoteric core. It will be the wizard behind the curtain and it won't be broadcast in the mainstream. You have to seek it out almost yourself. And it's gonna be like secret codes invented in the, in the circuit board, right? So the secret to alchemy is the transmutation of oneself. And that's like what we're all essentially trying to do. We're trying to change ourselves from an old self that was the version 1.0 of Alan yeah, into yeah. a version 2.0, 3.0. Yeah. And that's trying to be always in a process of betterment and discovery. And of course, it's not a race. You know, we all have to live in commerce. We all have our jobs. We all have to support ourselves. <clears throat> I understand that. And it's not anybody to judge or to race on those types of things. But transmutation just highlights people that are doing their part ever so slightly in walking that walk and talking the talk. And spiritual, our growth in life, obviously, that clip mentioned growth is just our life growth or our spiritual growth and that's what ultimately human yes. beings are designed to do we're designed we're here to grow in yes. this real in this you know what we could call a simulation of the realm of earth right yes. like we are you could have a very high level metaphysical conversation about us being spiritual beings having a human experience yeah but yeah. why are we here in material 3d reality it's yeah. like we're yeah. here to have experiences and then at some point be like what did you learn yeah, right? yeah, so yeah, yeah. that is obviously a process of change and you can't change without re, you know, expelling old ways of doing things. And as we expel old ways of doing things, we may lose friendships or have different yes, relationships yes, and yes, yes. You know, things come and go. But like nature does, you know, we looked at nature as a teacher or animistic cultures from the past. They had a connection to great spirit. And this, we can talk more about this with Shamans of Global Village. But you know, we had these deeper connections to our higher selves, you could say, or nature, or wisdom, or Gaia, or cosmos, or Pachamama. Mm -hmm. So transmutation is very much in this flavor of this esoteric practices, such as alchemy, and um, mysticism, and, and um, hermetic philosophy. So these are ancient spiritual philosophic systems that project wisdom through a path that you take. And it, you can read about it, but ultimately you must experience it through the various things that you do. And yes. as we were making the film, it was a very transformational process in making it. So I always try and, if I'm gonna make something that's gonna be a, a very difficult project that I'm going to get paid much less money for, it might as well be life transformative. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, there's, again, so much good stuff. Um, I wanna know what are the people doing in transmutation that are um, helping them uh, grow? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're rejecting old ways of being and knowing, and they're 
they're, they have built up a discernment to see what is good information versus what is bad information. And as anybody that's on a path of betterment or discovery, you're like, if you spend your time with earbuds in your ears listening to a great audiobook or a yummy podcast, and you're just searching out any sort of things that are like, how can I better myself through my own personal time? That's great. And so we highlight people in this film, of course, which is very much, it has a theme of a voiceover of kind of a spiritual philosophic voiceover by my brilliant colleague, Neil Kramer who is essentially a real mystic, a real actual mystic wrote this documentary. And then we show actual people to kind of break that up that are doing things that are transformative in their life through the ways of being and acting within the world that are very unconventional. But still, like all of us, you know, we have a mixture of our standard operating lives in suburbia or in the city that we have to kind of do our daily chores or maybe have our job. But it's all about the balance of these things. And we highlight them much in the film, like the wisdom of the sun and moon, for example, these divine opposites that give us an allegory of a masculine and feminine thing, yes. and the balance of these things, and how much life is so much about the balance of things for our own personal betterment, right? It's like, do you, that's, what, that's my issue I always have. It's not that I don't like tech or like big data or like technology, it's just how stupidly much we work, right? It's like we work these Protestant work ethics that are nuts, and it's great if you're on some leading edge of technology working on blockchain, and, but if you work in 90 hours a week, you, you can't work on your spiritual growth. And I know it's even worse in other countries like Japan. So it's just the balance of how much we do things. So there you go. So people that are finding balance and finding wisdom through the way that they're living their lives. <laughs> and some of the experiences that they're having, because it's all experiential. There's the, the, the this, 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 ha this has to be pulled up right now. This is, this is too <laughs> they have good. A reference. This is too good for, from, from literally today. Oh, do you, yeah. Um, yeah, Ron will, Ron will bring it up right now. Oh, there you go, yeah. Yeah, con con congratulations, you're hired. Thank you, I am so grateful for this opportunity to wake up at 6 a.m. and sit in traffic so that I can stare at a computer screen for eight hours every day. Yeah, one thing that we highlight in transmutation is essentially this modern perspective on e empire, right, which has always existed. And empire is there to crush the spiritual growth of every node on the network, right? So over time, eons of time, you know, empire has come to the forefront through like ancient days, and you saw it most highlighted in like theocratic times of the Dark Ages, when everybody, you know, if you said the wrong thing, you'd have your head cut off, or you stepped on the king's shadow in ancient Hawaii and they'd stab you. You know, these times where it's like nobody could say anything, and now we do live in crazy times. Yeah. But we can say stuff, and yes, yes. We, if we were having this conversation 500 years ago, we'd be like we're dead. You know, burned to a crisp. Yeah. So it's it's beautiful times to be alive. Which literally, yeah, happened to apparently Bruno uh, saying things like yes, Giovanna Bruno. Yeah. Yes, for speaking a little bit too much truth. You know, yeah. nobody still to this day in this society by saying a lot of truthful things gets you anywhere usually. Stand-up comedy is a great medium because you can actually inject, <laughs> inject wisdom it. into things. Music, music is another, is another wisdom. Uh, yeah. Film is another good one. Exactly. Yeah. The art, the, and the arts have always tried to, great art will always try and inject something that is a source of betterment through the art, right? So I do consider myself having come out of it, the background being an artist, still very much an artist in the works, and I hope that reflects in the production values of the content, but actually an artist that hopefully has things to say. So um, in that rambling, I forgot your initial question. Art's but. role is to like <laughs> embed uh, the, these most sacred aspects of like self-work and spiritual wisdom and all these types of things. Like that's part of art's role because you can embed it with music or poetry or um, comedy or yes. film. Ah, that's and when, huge. When you become a very seminal artist that's remembered, it's because you had things to say, right? And so with Michelangelo was painting the Sistine Chapel and inserted like symbolism into the work, mm -hmm. that's gonna stand the test of time. And things that have symbolic meaning usually transcend, right? So if you create shallow baby pool, lukewarm nonsense that may be visually stunning, but you're just doing it for some sort of you know corporate crap, yeah. occasionally you can insert something into that. But I always try, to me, I'm so uncommercial that I, it's, it's how do you balance being commercial and sustaining revenue with creating art, right? And a lot of artists have to do very commercial things. And just like Michelangelo wanted to paint his own thing, but he had to paint what the church wanted him to paint. Yeah, yeah, so it's yeah, this yeah. struggle through all of time, and I've talked about it extensively mm. in, uh, in places. I have, <laughs> Ronnie has some thoughts. I, I got it, but I, 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 I understand your dilemma. Yes. How do we stay afloat? Yeah. You, you just have to um, cut back on your 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 needs. Yes. Like I remember living in my van. I would find uh, cheap 
spaces and warehouses that would be yes. just so ultra cheap. You know, I remember in Biddeford, Maine, I found a place. I got myself a, my own hot water heater and a claws <laughs> foot bathtub, and I was good to go. Yeah, yeah. But um, th- th- again, they all, there's also something among us that, that doesn't want us to uh, create and make these movies and write these songs and poems and films and uh, we, we have to be very cautious, especially now with uh, creativity with artificial intelligence. Hmm. You know, yeah, I don't malevolent think, forces. Right. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's a, that was a good one, Ron. We're gonna get there too. Um, I wanna um, let's let's hit on this point quick. Just that what what Ron's saying about about like give, you know you give up some of the some of the things along this along the spiritual journey. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that um, has made it so much different today is that now we're like we're 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 you said like you used to be burned um, by uh, saying things that were of the point zero zero one percent. Now we actually have freedom, more freedom of speech with that, which is fantastic. At the same time, um, we have the the when you take like a photo of 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 yourself when you're doing things like. Um, you're worried about judgment. So many people are worried about judgment. Like if Ron is to live in a van or a warehouse as he does right. the artist or spiritual journey, like yeah. we're worried that our mom and our friends and pe- like that people are going to judge us yeah. versus if we were to just be like, I don't care about that and that stuff actually is there to just hold me back from my path, that would help us a lot. Yeah, um, yeah getting yeah. through that. Yeah, it's like human beings aren't designed to be in these massive judge dread mega Tokyo cities, you know, neo Tokyo cities of low, big cities of lonely people. You know, we're designed to be in more small Damn. town community. And so I think as we live more authentically, and we, you could say that we could have a whole another 17 hour conversation yeah, about yeah, peak yeah. oil and the decline of society, but as society does slowly, I, a, a collapse of society isn't like this zombie apocalypse thing. It's just a slow returning to more authentic ways of being, right? And so you find more modest and realistic ways of living and being, and you don't have such a high you know, cost of living. And you look at other cultures yeah, in the past, yeah. like indigenous yes. cultures or Native American cultures that lived in more communal aspects and had, you know, the village raised the child together and we have no cost of living or the Amish go and build a barn together and it's like, it's done. You don't have to pay a mortgage for 30 years. These are ways that give you much more freedom to be the artist or the creative. Yeah. Or you live in a tiny house these days. You know, you do alternate ways of being and acting that allow you to fuel your creative path, which I have always said that the creative path through what we create is us self-initiating ourselves into our own growth processes. And we always hit these challenges along the way because life is hard and life is a struggle and much of spirituality is this, is life. It's the 3D. It's not off in some other dimensional space, even though there's a, a reflection of that because nothing comes from here, everything comes from elsewhere. And that's kind of what you could say a uh, uh, piece of wisdom is as above, so below, yeah. right? You know, like if we have a higher dimensional version of ourselves, which people call all sorts of different things and it's fractaling down to this, yeah. you know, yeah. the inside is the cause and the outside is the effect, or you could say that for the above and below, right? Mm-hmm. So just finding ways to give your, yourself space is key, time and space. And so you, it's yes. difficult to do that when you're so, your wheels are spinning on a bunch of bullshit. Bullshit, yep. yeah. And so again, I, I'm never gonna say that people should just disavow their responsibilities. You know, we all have to totally. make money in commerce in this current time space vector. But how do you, it's always returns to these talks of balance. And I've found a way where luckily in my life I can balance things that I can make a feature documentary about things that would never be allowed through the dark sorcery gatekeepers of, yeah, yeah. you know, I'm not a big fan of gatekeepers, you know, people that are, we've given ourselves a position of this is what is good, you know, even things like film festivals or laurels or these things, film, most film festivals aren't there to help your film, they're there to help their festival. Occasionally you Damn. will find really cool people there, but it's not gonna, it, you know, allowing content that is so expansive through doesn't usually go over well. But on the other side of that, you, you will hit, hit an audience where people are really inspired and see it, like you mentioned in the work, where they get it, and that's really beautiful. And so you get occasional nice responses from people that really like the work or respect it. And if I am in some sort of conventional thing where people are picking up on it, and we happen to be in some sort of festival and people get it, that's great too, you know? 
I love so, I love the idea of a very s deeply spiritual a spiritual awakening driven film festival things like that that are that are there not for their own uh, personal growth of the film's gain or the festival's gains right. but for I want right. um, right. to we need to know some some questions here um, around the technicals of these things so how. What are you, uh, you were giving us the, um, you were writing out the story and making the narration, these types of processes. Okay, we get that. Yeah. Um, but then there's the actual process of going and identifying uh, what equipment to use, where to go and film, mm -hmm. how to edit it all together, doing things like in situ, uh, you have voiceovers with beautiful visuals happening. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, teach us about all that. You learn from experience and I have a background making essentially pretty pictures for big studio movies that were very high budget. And so I occasionally might still find myself doing a little freelance work, directing a commercial for a tech company in the Bay Area or something. And so bringing that knowledge of production value into a project, I knew that I had kind of synchronistically built up a skill set where the four legs of my cauldron, my alchemical cauldron, are being able to write things, direct things, shoot things, and edit things. Mm -hmm. And if you could do those four, you're yeah. pretty unstoppable as a filmmaker. I love that. Yeah, so I got to the point where as I was ever so slowly transmuting myself from my older, dumber self to what I am now, and I certainly, as you have cycles of life where you become the wise Gandalf wizard later in life or in, in another life or many lives down the line, you can argue that people that are understanding or trying to be on some sort of path of betterment have been here longer or older souls you could say um also there's one know, more pillar the market i wrote that <laughs> one down write direct shoot edit and market yes yeah, so that's, that's key yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. certainly a key component but anyway like okay. those technical aspects or things that as i was becoming better at doing those things i also sought out people that were e equally as knowledgeable about the material if not more so than me so uh neil kramer who wrote this film is it way further on the path than I was at the time and M is. So he was the narrator and writer of the doc and could speak to it in an excellent way. So I brought my production value to it while he brought the wisdom to it. And, I've, and I learned a lot just by being in this proximity with him. There's an ancient term, you'll like this, it's called disciplic succession. And it's basically like when you're next to somebody that's wise, it's like when Luke, when Luke went to go visit Yoda in the Dagobah uh -huh, system, uh -huh. Luke gets disciplic succession from Yoda. Okay, right? You like get transmission of knowledge. Succession. Okay, disciplic yeah. succession. And so okay. I feel like Neil gave me disciplic succession just by walking around the Pacific Northwest in these ancient old growth forests with a real mystic that actually transmitted information and insight to me. Just like any, you know, that you go up to the ashram on the mountain to learn Kung Fu and the Kung Fu master transmits data and knowledge and wisdom to you. And so the same thing with our You are the five people you surround yourself with, these types of- Yeah, processes. and that's why you, you, you all, it's, it's important to put yourself around people that are knowledgeable as well or on your same vibratory level, same wavelength, or people that can teach you things. Yes. And that's what we yes, yes. grossly lack in our society is wise elders of knowledge and spirit. Do you, you ever know? notice that there are some people that surround themselves with people that are not as smart as they are, so that they feel smarter. I just want to, yeah. you know, this, we have these people among us. I just want to. There's also a phenomenon with um, men and women that surround themselves with people that are not as attractive as they are. So um, they look more attractive. So this, that's funny, man. Yeah, that's another so thing, Niles, when you talk about uh, in your younger day when you reference how that you weren't very bright, you were you were stupid. I think you said <laughs> I find that extremely hard to believe. I think even at your worst, you were just shining above uh, those beers. Again. Well, thank you, man. I mean, think, I think that we're all, you know, we have these, as kids, we might be this little introspective little kid, you know, who's in our own world and like little kids can see, have read into things well. Like you can be in some weird, like you'd be in some Southern Baptist church, but you'd see this guy that's like, Jesus Christ, he's talking in a fake voice. And the little kid in the little Baptist church instantly reads the fakeness and the, the, the artificiality of this person, right? Mm. So kids have pretty good discernment for that, usually until they're indoctrinated, apparently if they get you, if something indoctrinates you, it's by like by age seven or age 10, if they've got you, it's really hard to, un, mm. to unindoctrinate yourself, to unplug from your matrix pod. So. Kids are pretty good <laughs> about that, from your right? Matrix right. Plot. No, it's, yeah, it, that's a great way to put it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but but that's something that I think into matrix plots. As a little introspective kid, I did see things in other ways, and you don't have language to describe what you're interested in or why I like the dark psychedelia of the band Tool. Why am I called to? You have a you know on your coaster, you have a, a, a cult image of this hand, right? Yeah, Which you yeah. could argue is like the Hamza hand or the hand of the mysteries, as Manly Palmer Hall would say. But like, why do you like a 
a hand that's in dark psychedelia of the band tool, why are you drawn to that imagery but you don't know why? So it's like you, you, cert, you eventually get discerned enough that you become to be able to describe these things and communicate it to others. And that's what we can do well as we get better and as we hopefully can share knowledge and insight is how you communicate it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So looking, <laughs> yeah, yeah, th and that's the one of the ma major roles of film, poetry, music, comedy, is to disseminate these <clears throat> insights and awaken, inspire people. Yeah, I love that. Okay, let's um, and you said experience was the big thing. So actually, going out and learning these pillars, um, writing, directing, shooting, editing, marketing, going and doing that process over and over again. I I got so lucky that a couple years ago that people started telling me, Alan, just practice Premiere. Just go and start yeah, editing your own stuff. you learn by stuff. doing. You learn by doing. You and totally so quickly, doing. now we're making these cool 60 second videos. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it's really, it just takes the practice, the experience. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and if you're gonna make something on your own, you might as well make it paradigm crushing. You know, you yes, might as right. well do That's something right, that, not, right. that, the, that it's not gonna come, it's not gonna come from the top down, it's gonna come from the bottom up, right? So you, you may as well, well make it paradigm crushing? <laughs> what a statement. Well, you mean I, I can't put toothpaste into Oreos and feed them to the homeless and <laughs> capture it? Well, the metaphor is, yeah, there's no putting the toothpaste back in the tube when you've discovered something and you wanna yeah, 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 somewhat yeah, yeah. insert that. So that, that is the discouraging thing, is there's such saturation of content now that a lot of it is not very good. You know, it's just yeah. like, it might reel you in, but what does it have to say? Yeah. And it's not like my work is on this high horse, but I think that the works are starting to give out a signal that they have things to say, and I'm happy with that, right? From our, the various forms of media I create. Yep, yep. Yeah. Okay, so now let's get um, the two shamans of the Global Village. So the first episode, um, when was that published? Last year? We made it, we shot it in 2015 and we made it in 2016. So Shamans of the Global Village, I know you talked about with Rack, but it's yes. basically an independent investigative documentary series about shamanic cultures and the shamanistic path and how shamanism is a key component to a healthy civilization or community. Because in our society these days, the metaphor I use is, in all respect to our loved ones, is we have this society of essentially childish asleep robots, where we have these automaton people that are ch essentially little kids in adult bodies, right? They haven't had an initiatory experience into knowing who they are, how they fit into the greater ecology of things. So yeah. ancient cultures always had these ceremonies or these practices where you essentially go on your spirit quest as you're a young sprout in you know yes. you're 16 and you go on a, a spirit quest or you have a psychedelic shamanic experience and you you are it's you're initiated into adulthood right and just like these mindsets of having our politicians that sadly every once in a while Sturgeon's law you get people that are decent in politics but you know you get these other deplorable excuses for human beings that don't know anything and they don't know anything about like who they are or what they're doing or where we're going so having this mindset where it's like what if we initiated these people into shamanic medicines as like just number one precursor for being a representative a representative of the people and not just special interests if you have a larger understanding of what human beings are and where we're going and why we're doing these things yes. and how we can live in more authentic ways of being that connect us more to great spirit you know which is if you're interested in nature or animal you know welfare or the rights of indigenous peoples it's like all these things check the boxes of being more connected more connected to great spirit right great spirit just being the larger ecology of things and how animistic cultures have always recognized they've used the term i've talked to spirits you know, that's just their way of saying that my higher self, my higher vibrational density self, which sounds a little woo, but ultimately like you, your higher self that can connect to knowledge and wisdom through what some people call like the Akashic record, mm -hmm. gives gnosis or insight. And you can get that when you're tuned in enough, when you haven't had, you're not eating shit food or you're not like drinking tons of, you know, caffeine or you're masturbating every day or you're doing these things that are contractive, even though there's great times to have do all these things, you know, to have all the, there's places for all things that can be. Masturbating every day expansive. is not good for you. Right. It's great to have, a, have an orgasmic experience like on occasion, but you know, everything in moderation that tune you into these larger, you know, the greater ecology of things. So that's just what I'm saying is that if you, again, back to balance always, yeah. but we highlight in the show ancient cultures that do this very well and they have their own problems too, you know, because they're suffering through the, the crisis times of the environment these days with all the crisis levels that we're at and 
the struggles of them having to operate within commerce and the current dynamic. So we highlight various tribal cultures that have had a shamanic practice and hopefully have given a lineage of ancient wisdom through some what's called um, neo-shamanism, you know, modern day shamanism, through somebody that might be from the United States or might be from Mexico or somebody that's from, you know, an indigenous culture that is training to become a shaman. That's essentially somebody that helps people realize that so much of their problems are a spiritual problem, right? In terms of everything, in terms of their life issues, in terms of health and wellness. And, you know, the petrochemical pharmaceutical industry has such a monopoly on health and, and well-being that they don't, allowing any sort of holistic things through or any sort of things that aren't the status quo is very difficult to, to get through. So shamanism becomes such a loaded term for the, again, back to the unstream, you know, unreality signal of standard operating procedure. And as you could say something very paradigm destroying, which is that all religion is based on astrotheology, our connection to the cosmos and shamanism, right? Because shamanism is as old as the hills. Mm -hmm. I think shamanism is as old as, as <clears throat> however many, many long, long time ago that we are, you know, we see ancient civilizations and cultures that clearly knew things more than we did. And I, yeah. I would say that's because they had connection to great spirit. They were getting their, you know, iCloud data downloads yeah, that were yeah. giving them knowledge and insight as to how to build this pyramid in this specific point with this specific, like, you know, tools, how we did this in advanced ways to connect up to the, you know, at the summer solstice at this particular location at this particular time. And you see in ancient civilizations reflections of this yeah. where you wonder how much like how did these people get this insight and wisdom and it's because of connection to our higher selves which is that's the con of kind of empire is just decoupling from who we really are and what we're capable of right and yeah. all the powerfulness that we can manifest and as we seek out our own paths in life and i would say like you and i had talked about earlier finding our what uh Joseph Campbell called like find your bliss, right? Yeah, like yeah. find your real way in life. That's yeah. really the reflection of you. So you do work or what Alistair Crowley says is do what thy will shall be the whole of the law. Find things that allow you to fulfill your true will and gives you energy. So your work gives yes, you energy yes. instead of taking your energy. Yes, right? yes, so you're, yes, yes, you may be yes, going yes. to, we're here on Market Street in San Francisco, which is a, a wild and it's kind of like the uh, cantina in Star Wars or something sometimes. You see a whole, whole spectrum of the freaks of the industry mixed with like, you know, the very professional tech people of going to their jobs on Twitter. It's ridiculous. Yes. Yeah, and you see yes. the full spectrum of society and how we have massive problems and yeah. you know, amazing things that we're doing. Earth is such a polarized place where you see human beings are the giant, the biggest steaming pieces of shit on Earth and they're also the most wonderful things ever, right? And we have yes. amazing yes, capabilities yes. of better, bettering society. That's an ex, <laughs> just this, <laughs> so eloquently described, you're dichotomizing it so perfectly. Yeah, yeah, it's... it's kind of like kids, you know, I have a two-year-old and it's the same way with kids. People always think kids are so great and the truth is they're both the biggest steaming pieces of shit and the most wonderful things ever. <laughs> exactly, yeah, you know, exactly. That's how yeah, kids really are. And that's, so kids awesome. show you that. You know, and, yeah. and that's, yeah, yeah. Anyway, funny, funny. Very, very well said. <laughs> um, so much good stuff there. Now, um, would, would we, um, so, so the first one was on the Sonoran Desert Toad, and correct. that was in 2016 was released. That's correct. Okay, and um, there were some really profound takeaways from that. Just, just for me, just the way that um, humans connect to uh, the creatures of the Sonoran Desert Toad, how they connect to the land, how they connect to the um, to the to the spirit that is working with the creature to then get the 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 venom that's secreted from the gland, yeah. the five MeO DMT. Yes, um, that that whole thing. It's not just a come here, let me get this from you. I'm gone. It's it's a massive intent. It's like a connection, divine. And this next one that's coming out is on the peyote cactus episode. That's two. correct. Yeah. So episode each episode focuses on a specific medicine person working with a specific medicine. So the first episode was released in 2016, completely independently. Again, we just made it ourselves. And, um, you know, as a slow drip, low budget project, we're just making episodes, hopefully more often than the band Tool makes an album. <laughs> and you guys, and, pay, uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a pay per view of yeah. like $5, $10? Yeah, we like just that. pay for either you can download it or rent it. And in an ideal world, that's how you do it. You create your yeah. content that yes. you is your own content and you'd sell it directly to audience. So I really do and love. You, there's some nuance because also there's like, yes, we want to um, make uh, our ability to continue making content so people supporting us through five or $10 of payments, yeah. as well as 
as those that like can't afford it around the world to even pay that much to somehow have a, like that's a scholarship true. version that's free. So like this content is free, and mm -hmm. then we just say, hey, like you're getting a cup of coffee, like just give us five bucks a month to help us do this. You know, so yeah. there's different there's different methods for this it, process. It's a good point when we go and visit a, a tribe who has they do some beautiful things and they also, you see their struggles and their hardships and how many of those people could even afford to rent the show, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So as we just, yes, just have filmed the second episode at the time of this recording, which is on peyote, and we just kind of let these things come about synchronistically, again, using the projects as our own vehicles for growth and transmutation mm -hmm. and experience. Rack and I just kind of let them come about when they naturally come and we get an offer to do something or the stars align to make it happen, even with limited resources. But it's a good point that even us as independent filmmakers, you know, just having a, a monetization stream that can keep the show going, even though it's by no means we're getting rich off this stuff, but at the same time, it is allowing the gears to turn ever so slowly to get to more episodes. It's nice that you mentioned that from reference points of like, we're in the Bay Area, it's like you hear the statistics about if you make $40,000 a year, that's nothing in the Bay Area, but for most of the world, that's an amazing amount of revenue. Yeah, yeah. So you, it's, very, it's very healthy to go into a third world country or a country of struggle and not be the you know imperialistic anthropologist but more the journalist that sees how people live and operate and how see so, how see how so much of the world has so little materially and how they have their struggles but how there's also things that they do very well much of south america you know they live in dirt floor huts but the kids are having a great time yeah, yeah. it's not like they don't have their struggles but there's a beauty to that rather than there is hashtag look up staring down at your stupid smartphone. Yeah. So yeah. balance, balance again, you know, I have a smartphone. <laughs> yeah, so can we, oh, this is good. So can we, can we balance the, um, the amount of signal that we're getting from the, um, the get out rid of the noise, be vigilant, don't go to the Joker vortexes, but find the <laughs> signal. I love George Joker vortex, that's such you a good one. You remember from the old Batman show, they yeah. got like spirals coming out of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like you watch the, you know, mainstream unreality signal of bobblehead talking news networks. That's, they're not, a, politics is not about expanding language. It's about contracting language, right? So when you get things that Damn, are Damn, it's not about the nuance. It's about contracting. Yeah, so when you hear somebody that's talking about real shit and it's like, well, they're actually saying things that I haven't heard before. They're blowing my mind, you know, like. Like right now, Like, yeah. you know, Philip K. Dick wrote or something. You're like, wow, he's actually saying things that are expansive. That is, should be a beacon for following that signal, right? Ah, okay, yeah. got it, guys. So that acts as a beacon. So, um, okay, cool. So, okay, so a beacon is expansive thinking. Okay. I would hope so. I and like that. I like you know. that. And versus contracting, which is a lot of what the, um, the mainstream political narratives is. Right. Because it's like, do you ever see... The metaphor I use for that is in the 60s, you know, revolution. Did you see Richard Nixon saying really amazing, empowering things? Or did you see Timothy Leary saying amazing, empowering things? Yeah, and who was yeah, the da yeah, most yeah. dangerous man in America? Yeah, right. Yeah, so there's yeah. the, I sometimes use this term mirror, mirror, where it's like everything is mirrored back to front, right? So what you thought was the case oftentimes turns out to be the exact opposite, right? And that's, you see that even more in other countries where you see that things are usually back to front and upside down. And so as you start following a path of, of wisdom or what you could say is, occultism just means hidden. So people think it means all this dark shit of like standing around doing a bloody pentagram, you know, doing some crazy ritual. And there are, there is dark occultism out there and you know, things with high level pedophilia in the entertainment industry and things like that. But much of occult practice is just about empowering yourself through your own practices to do things that you know, give you esoteric insight. So that comment that I just laid down, I think is a reflection of having esoteric development through our experiences that give us real gnosis that then you can see what is actually the nature ever so slightly of reality, right? Like what is real versus what is not? And you'd be surprised how much of reality is illusory, right? Yeah. And so a lot of the times in Shamans of the Global Village, you know, we'll get some the shaman will tell us something about how the earth changes now or a reflection of how human beings are acting. Right? That's if right. If we act like dumbasses, the Gaian ecosystem, the larger ecology, will force us to do things that stop us from doing unsustainable practices, yes, yes. things like that. So there's a huge as above, so below connection with how we do things and our, the larger, greater ecology of things. And I think human beings are extremely powerful and uh, we're tricked into thinking that we don't have any power, right? Mm -hmm. So. Commerce is a huge tool that uses that, that just distracts us into the realm of wasting our time or spinning our wheels. And as everything is corporatized, you see much less wisdom in that. You know, our names are corporatized, our 
Yeah, yeah. You know, you know what I mean. So, yeah. It, yeah. It, it, maybe a good um, couple words for it is our origins are obfuscated. Sure, yeah, sure. So yeah. as soon as that obfuscation happens, distractions, distortions, joker vortexes, the, the nature, the connection to nature, to spirit, to source, where we all came from, yeah. how we all breathe the air and how we're all interconnected with all that is here on the planet, that the gratitude that we have for even the water and the food and the showers, the elements, and stuff, yeah. it's, it's out the window because the obfuscation is there sh taking us away from the origins. Yeah, and that's just distraction. I mean, so much of life is distraction from what is a good way of being, right? How, how you can truly spend your time. And I think that we come here to learn and to grow. And if we spend our time doing things that are excellent and fulfilling, then it's much more rewarding and you feel better. You know, you have much less suffering in your life. And it's just like, it's like the dynamic where some experience that is a, if you have you know, years of meditating, how much better you feel, you know, maybe that's not for everybody. Or if you have an yeah. ibogaine experience, you know, a, a boga can be 10 years of psychotherapy in two nights. So there's all sorts yeah. of beautiful ways to get to it. Or you have, you know, another metaphor, metaphor for a spiritual path is like mountaineering or something, you know, some pilgrimage you yeah. go on yeah. through, you know, a Himalayan trip or something, you know, that's not a good example because people do so much damage to Mount Everest as they climb it. I just read an article, they live thousands of piles of junk on it but like if I heard go, that's the reason why the Himalayans shook off some of the Tibetan um, from them oh was, really was because they didn't uh, ask the mountains if they could set up oh. a massive they didn't they didn't connect to the greater ecology and ask the mountain if it was the right time to do it or they didn't have knowledge of their solar lunar cycles the astrological perspectives of like is this the proper time to do this you know, just like ancient cultures did. They knew when was the proper time to plant or see or when was the proper time to set up this monument. It's like that connection gives us much more wisdom for a real way of being. And in this room too, we have to tell ourselves that who, where we're at in this room, who was initially on this land a thousand or more years ago yes. that was yes. on this land first? Yes, and do you have, another way of looking at that is do you know not to say people to just do an ancestry test, but do you know your lineage of your, where you're from and where your people are from and have you visited your land? Yeah. That type of stuff has huge benefit. But the point of what I was gonna yes. say is just the pilgrimage, right? It's the pilgrimage. When we make these shows, it's always like a pilgrimage for us that it's very difficult and a huge yeah. amount of struggle and Rack may have talked about that, but it's very rewarding and each time it's like we level up in Donkey Kong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do level up you know? every time. Every show is yeah. a level. It's like yeah. it's experience points. Yes. For you guys, yes. it's like it's a leveling up because you do it so much more um, uh, rarer. Um, yes, it's they're slow drip projects, and yeah. these these projects, I this is documentary narrations. Yeah, I've just okay. gotten in the habit of like taking all this. I shoot thousands of hours of this footage with hopefully beautiful stuff, and it's like how can I just use some of this footage as extra little snippets of insight that are smaller drip projects? So I just post them as like these little tone poemy essay things. We were talking about you know your writing and how you'll write something put it over an intro piece, and that's essentially like you making a mini doc. I find myself occasionally, I will also call myself an essayist, even though I'm amateur at that, but essays are a way to insert some sort of insight into things, just sharing life insights. And so as somebody that creates essays as well, spoken word essays, I've also started as a documentary filmmaker, just writing documentaries that are essentially just like a visual essay. So these documentary narr narrations are just me writing out hopefully something that's just a piece of insight over something that has relevant visual yumminess and putting those two together, right? And so I'll just drop those as little breadcrumbs along their way. Yes. And, you know, it's just fun. It's just you enjoy doing it. It gives you energy. It doesn't take your energy. It's yes, not about, correct, correct. you know, we could talk about the balance of how great it is to have see people see your stuff amongst being so commercial in your, you know, promotion of stuff. But I also un understand that marketability and commercialism has its place in today's society. So again, as any artist, I'm no different. I would love people to know the work and recognize the work and appreciate the work. But we, we also see in Mirror Mirror that some of the most rubbish content is the most popular content. You know, we don't get, we all know that the little, that the most best music doesn't come from top 40. It comes from the little indie garage band or something like that. Or we know that people's, you know, that sometimes the top 100 people are the worst 100 people. You know, these influencers of, you know, slimy things that just project stuff that doesn't have any. It's all about material game. It's all about materialism, essentially, which, you know, usually gets the most eyes, eyeballs on stuff because of its commercial value. And one secret to real 
excellence is that it is never commercial, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you, you, again, balance. So sometimes you'll have something that leads you into something. But if you find the real yummy stuff, the real wisdom, it's not going to be very, it'll be little, it'll have little commerciality if none. Yes. If none. Yes. Yeah. And that's kind of the, the ancient wisdom, the mystery school dynamic of like, how do you seek out real people doing excellent things in underground ways? Is they're not going to be broadcasting signal to the public. They're going to be kind of on the, I don't want to say they're on the shady dark web or something, but they're, you find them through word of mouth or you find them in old paradigm ways of how, who did that, you know, amazing blacksmith work for you in the old village and yeah. you, you're, you hear yeah. about it through, that's through it, the yeah. networks, yeah. right? And that's how you find people that are really, I think, are influential to you on your, on your life, in your life. The, the, there's, like, even, even, with the, even with a show like this or with your viewership is that actually our content is uh, 99% that are people that are watching the content. Otherwise, there'd be no purpose for it. Sure. So yeah. like, it's like, thank yeah. you for watching. Yeah, and it's, nice, it's lovely to have feedback on your work and have people appreciate your work. And as you know, somebody that is doing their own thing, that's always my, some of my biggest life problems at this time space vector are issues of scale, right? It's like you do, you find a, a balance in your life or you're at that frequency where everything you're doing is great and you really are happy and you're resonating, but then how do you make it work scale wise? You don't want it to be so scaled up that it becomes, you know, elements of dark sorcery that become contractive. And I think that when somebody starts some company and it, they have good intentions originally, and then it becomes this malevolent thing, this hydra, this tentacle hydra that's invading all aspects of our lives through NSA spying and dark, dark skull duggery. It's like, did the founder of that small entity really plan for that to happen? I think it gets co-opted at some point. But at the same time, as we are small enterprises or maybe small business owners, it's great to support your small business and, yeah, let them know that you appreciate the work. Like any author, you know, like any, anybody that writes a book or paints a painting. It's like, yeah. we love your art. We love your work. It's yes, awesome. Yes, yes, feedback. yes. You watch a good video, comment, thank you. Yeah. You know, just the simple things matter so much. Totally. Send totally. a quick email, thank you, that was very profound. Um, you've inspired me or what have you. Or yeah. if there's feedback, you can potentially do this or that better. We appreciate proactive, it. Yes. Proactive, proactive feedback. feedback. Like not being a reactionary, you know, whiny person. You, you, you also said that there's a ton of signal potentially in the um, shows that have like the least amount of views and stuff. I thought there's also poop. There too. Oh sure. So sure, that's, sure. that's yeah yeah yeah. So yeah. so it's interesting. There's a, there's the Beagle. dichotomy between having there being um, within the Pareto so much crap at the tail end, but crap. also that's a good one too. Yeah, Poop, crap. Fecal crap. Fecal crap. That that there's so much of that, but then there's also really good nuggets. Some of the most profound videos I've seen on the internet have like 20 views or 100 totally. views. Yeah. So these are um, other things. Let's let's hit on this point quick, and I'm actually interested to hear how Ron ends up uh, um, playing with you on this point. But mm -hmm. tell us about the dark gatekeepers. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. You can only really talk about what you know experientially, and you can hear stories from like secondhand type dynamics. I knew somebody when I was working in Hollywood that said that this was not me experiencing this directly because I wasn't at a higher enough, high enough level in the hierarchy to be invited to this thing. But he said that he was essentially invited to a real Kubrickian eyes wide shut sex orgy at some you know mansion in LA, and there were very knowledgeable people there. So that type of stuff, you know, does go on. It resonates, what you can really only speak to is what... All right, so no surprise that as we literally started talking about the dark gatekeepers, mm -hmm. that the stream crashed. And so now we'll just be stitching together this recording with the first one. So wow, Ron's been talking about this stuff for a long time mm. and it's finally starting to creep up more and more into my awareness and wow, it just happened to us. And you have been talking about these dark gatekeepers to me since we've started talking mm. as well. So why don't you now start teaching us about what this really is? Again, I'm not an expert on it. I'm just a student of all this. And I could, you can only speak to what you've experienced and what also you feel into, right? So dark gatekeepers is just my magical language to describe things that aren't in your best interest or do not provide you with expansion. They provide you with contraction. And we find as we go along a path of self-betterment or being what you might call an autodidact, a self-taught person, mm -hmm. you find it's like, why didn't I know about this? Why is the schooling system intentionally dumbing me down? Or why is the health, you know, 
why, are, why am I getting all this poor information on what is accurate for what I should be putting in my body? And then you come to realize that you know, these industries that are essentially supposed to be helping us, and they call it, they reduce us into these things called consumers, which sounds like something that would be on a Black Friday zombie apocalypse you know, video. As us are, are not consumers, we're actually infinite fractals of consciousness, and you know, we're beings that have huge, powerful capability. We come to realize that these, there's sources at foot that are intentionally trying to restrict us and contract us. And the only way to, again, move beyond these things is how what we do on our own and what we self-discover through our own paths of betterment and discovery. And I would argue that that is an, an initiatory process for every person in their life. You are here in life to initiate yourself through a series of obstacles in life mm -hmm. that the, you could call it empire or what Philip, Philip K. Dick called it empire. Just systems that distract and provide illusion through every channel, right? And it gets very conspiratorial. You know, it gets through, you could, you could go down endless conspiratorial paths and one step along a journey of betterment or discovery or spiritual growth is, you know, kind of breaking through the glass ceilings of, of conspiracy and not getting so bogged down in only conspiracy and like FEMA trailers and chemtrails and all this stuff. But realizing that, again, polarization of life, there's horrendously awful things going on and there's also striking amazing beauty going on. So how do you look at all these things from a glass half full, glass half full perspective, excuse me, of being a creditor and not a debtor, or not somebody that's in service to others instead of just service to self, and turning to the dark side essentially of like going down what's called a magic, you know, a sorcery path versus a, a wizard path, which is, that's more of, you know, fiction. But as you could separate the Lord of the Rings versus some sort of legitimate ceremonial magical practice that somebody has in real life. But it feels to me in everything that I've learned through my breakthroughs that I've realized these things are there and they didn't tell me that. And it's like, why didn't you tell me that? You know, why did I have to learn that on my own? Or why did I have to hear about that word of mouth? So system wise, as things get centralized and big, they're more prevalent in constricting human consciousness and contracting human beings, right? And so the sovereign awake human is there to grow and break through these things. And as every node of the network, you know, slowly improves, it's kind of end game for old ways of operating. And that's why we see that we need to move on to new societal ways of operating systems. And even people that might listen to this or in their standard operating procedure know that they're in a system that's rubbish, but people have huge excellence, right? So it's like systems become rubbish. And then we as individual nodes need to do our own, need to broadcast beacons to be our own excellent selves. And how can we slowly get rid of old systems. And I don't think it's a massive crash, but it's like, yeah, yeah. how does you know, something like a new technology like cryptocurrencies over 30 years become the new currency from right. you know, horrendously dark sorcery, uh, centralized fiat money systems that yeah, have, yeah. You know, are run by the, what is it in uh, John Carpenter's They Live, those aliens with like the rubber masks. Oh, you know, yeah. Yeah. Or, or you, know, you, you can even get into very high metaphysical conversations about, you know, entities that are non-corporeal things that are controlling human beings or contr it's like a control factory. I don't get into that we're in this hive of, of restriction in our matrix pods and it's all malevolent. I think that we are in a realm that's a beautiful place, yes. but we act like as we become more conscious, we realize that we're in this, we have this capability to make this reality a garden that, and that's what yes. we should be. We're not here to d exploit and pollute and do awful things that are again, Sometimes sustainable becomes a little bit of a buzzword, but one of the thoughts is yeah. that if the if this body, if we ourselves are not consciously connected to source and spirit and our own north star and following that trajectory, avoiding joke, Joker vortexes, yes. that gives the space for the evil entity to occupy and then um, walk us down Joker vortexes and all the nonsense. Yes, yes. And my colleague on transmutation, Neil Kramer, does an excellent job of talking about empire from an esoteric perspective. I originally found a modern version of empire through Philip K. Dick in his book, Valis. He continuously references the fact that the empire never ended. And it just goes kind of, it's just either on the surface or else it goes kind of underground, right? So mm. it's either, what is it? When it's either um, out in the open or else it's hidden, yeah. right? So it's, yeah. it's, that's, that's what's going on is we have, we live in modern times, which it's a beautiful time to be alive, but there's very much still systems that don't benefit us and how can we find ways of doing our true will or following our bliss that operate in new ways of being or like systems that 
our communal sharing systems. And again, I think we get back to old original ways of living in, more in community, and then maybe we'll have a society that's more connected to spirit, and we have you know, excellent wise elders or excellent shamans, and the distractions and illusions go away. You know, they, or they, the signal to noise ratio of the negative is reduced because people don't, they don't, it doesn't work on them anymore. You know, even something like commercial content, it's like, can you listen to, can you watch standard television ads and does that work on you anymore? No, not at all, no. not at yeah. all. And, and I've even went as far as to plug my ears when listening to the top radio, all right. music in right. the car. The per, it's like, no, I refuse to listen to it. Because you're, you're at a level where you're, sounds wooey, but you're vibrating higher than that stuff. I don't right? want to hear the yeah. money, drugs, women, materialistic possessions, music. I don't want to hear it. I, it's actually, it, 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 if you don't think it makes a, an impact on you moment to moment to moment, it totally does. So yeah. if you can cancel out your neural infrastructure having to deal with listening to that, mm -hmm. Um, that actually upgrades um, you further. And same thing with the commercials. You're like, do they work on you? No, the answer yeah. is no. Can you, you're yeah. giving us all of this, um, the dark gatekeeper stuff from the abstract, which I totally, and big picture stuff, yes. which is super important. But give us the exact examples of your, um, um, uh, the way that you've been like pu publishing content and how those, these right. forces have impacted you. Well, I mean, I think my work personally, I always find that it's, it's hard to reach anything that bypasses a gatekeeper. So I'm, my work is constantly shut down by the gatekeepers. And call the gatekeepers anything. I mean, you can call the gatekeepers, like I mentioned, a film festival or somebody that promotes content, you know, rises content up to a higher place. Yeah. And we could get very deep in the weeds of how commercial and marketable it is. But a lot of it is just, you know, designed to not just speak to the Burning Man crowd or the inner crowd of what, you know, the psychedelic community is or people that are interested in spiritual growth or occult or esoteric content, which is few, because again, back to the origin, origins of this conversation, most people don't even know what those things are or what they mean. Yeah. But as they find that these are core excellences that empower human beings and the secrets to reality will be found through the gates of these things, right? Through some of these practices that we mentioned. That's very empowering to people and to people that are interested that have the ears to hear it. So I always try and put forth stuff that even though it's such hopefully decent content, I'm shocked by how much it's shut down, right? Now, that doesn't mean that it's shut down by people that will connect with it. When people see it, it's like, oh, I loved it, that's great. And that, you know, occasionally I will get great responses like that, like hopefully you find you do through the show as well. But it, I always find that the most it's not just directly or easy or fair to say that the most rubbish stuff is the most seen stuff. Because sometimes you see stuff that's very, you know, yeah. gets a broad reach and it's pretty good. And that's great. And I call it being on the high traffic highways versus being off in the wilderness somewhere, right? So as you make things that, the more you know, the less people understand what you're talking about. So you have to find <laughs> the dynamic of how do I insert something in here that's translatable and relatable versus how do I make something that's so esoterically weird they're not even going to get it. And then you're off at, you know, again, the forest from the trees. And then the ultimate um, way is the more you know and the better you can communicate. Yes. Yeah, that's the real gem of a person. Another example, and I haven't had a direct experience with this, is something like this would be super, super paradigm destroying. But you start getting into things where you advocate certain holistic practices for health and you know somebody that's had has cancer or something and they're you know being told the traditional ways of treating cancer when there's all these suppressed ways of treating cancer through yes. herbal remedies or through yes, yes. you know shark uh, what is it sharks don't get cancer or like you know there's cannabis is a you know a suppressed cure for cancer and there's mm -hmm. various forms of there's a essiac tea that apparently is a you know remedy there's there's these you can li you can find about 10 legit or at least seeming to feel like they have some validity, you know, alternate cancer treatments for me. And I haven't had the personal experience of having cancer and see them work on me personally, but they're, what they're doing resonates with me. And then you see the massive, you know, healthcare industry, which is as, you know, top down as you get as the fossil fuel industry or the pharmaceutical industry is, you know, that's a place that cares more about its profits than the health and well-being of its patients. I'm not saying it doesn't care about the health and well-being of patients, it's just a very distant second 
to its massive corporate profits. So when massive corporate profits get in the way, and this is not a left or right thing because it's corporatized government, agreed. Yeah, it's, agreed. it should be completely not political. It's not political. So Perverse incentives. Yeah, so I, I have had things that I've done holistically or beneficially that I was never told that by a doctor. Or I was never told that by somebody that's a sanctioned authority on the thing from, you know, they're being, having a PhD or being a college professor or being a lawyer. It's like there's a lot of things that you can find within the legal industry, within what's called sovereignty of your own legal entity that you're never told by like a standard lawyer or you never are told about the trivium education system that we used to know about that, you know, in the 1800s, there's like letter, beautifully articulate written letters of deep, you know, verbal um, sophistication written by war soldiers in the 1800s because they had a traditional liberal arts education. And it's like, how come school teachers today don't know about the seven liberal arts, you know, of grammar, logic, rhetoric, and go down the line of that? So there's all this stuff that is essentially kept from us that's suppressed that is now coming. The internet has been a great tool to reveal these things, even though there's always top down forces trying to turn off insightful stuff. And mm. it doesn't mean that, you know, we shouldn't suppress things that are you know, hateful things, but at the same time is hate speech free speech. So it gets into a, a big topic of conversation of like, is it very healthy to recognize alternate spatial models of the universe versus, you know, recognizing and admitting to everything that a massive scientific orga organization would tell us. So it's, it's a whole, you know, it has to, it, it goes into every aspect of your life, this stuff. And it's, it very much changes you, or you could say transmutes you as you, you know, continue doing it in your life. We'll have to revisit another conversation with Niles about, about <laughs> all of this stuff and we'll, we could bring Rack back and Ryan and different um, boss and stuff and different um, oh, yeah, people. Oh yeah, that'd be fun. It would, yeah. be, it would be another good conversation for sure. We'll have to do that maybe later this summer. Um, okay, let's wrap on a couple, <clears throat> let's wrap on a couple questions. Yeah. Um, so you've already, I think, mentioned this uh, throughout the show a couple times, but what what is the the grand narrative of from all that is into these human Earth suits? That's a fifty thousand hour conversation. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would just yeah, say if that you want to wrap the show up, but then you ask a question like that. Let's just ask the simulation. I, I have question. a very simple answer. I got drugs to do. Let's go. Come on. <laughs> very, very simple answer is that we are we are spiritual beings having a human experience. Spiritual beings yeah. having a human experience. That's absolutely. I yeah. found that to absolutely be the case, and it doesn't mean that you are in some sort of traditional structure of orthodoxy. But esotericism has helped my life hugely by empowering me and giving me less suffering, right? And so I would highly encourage to seek out people that have esoteric knowledge and insight. Somebody like Rudolf Steiner, for example, or George Ivanovich Gurdjieff, or Helena Blavatsky, or, um, you know, you can go down the list of various people that have stuff that when you read, you don't understand. It's like reading the Tao Te Ching, where it's like, I don't understand any of this, but keep revisiting it. You know, keep seeking out good content because what you input will outwardly manifest in what you output. So yes. input yummy information yes. so you can output yummy information. That's right. And you know, create more and consume less. That's right. I yeah. love it. Spiritual beings having human experiences. Create more, consume less. Yeah. All right, let's hit um, the next question. <laughs> uh, are we alone in the cosmos? I don't think so. You know, again, another 15 hour conversation. When you look at the cosmos of like what's off earth is material, I had this bonkers psychedelic experience once where I, I was gleamed some insight that felt that like everything off world is other dimensional, right? So the inner verse is very cosmic and all, some of my psychedelic experiences have been very astral cosmic. And what you could argue, there's an ancient book of hermetic philosophy called the Corpus Hermeticum that isn't saying the earth is, is flat or anything like that, but it's giving you some insights as to like alternate spatial models of the universe and what we are in is different than what we think. Nor does it mean it's like a snow globe with puppet string holders out of it that are you know, robots you know, controlling us in some malevolent cage. But what we're in, we don't quite understand. And so I had this, I had this feeling that everything in the outer verse is really the inner verse, vice versa, right? So whatever we're, we're saying that we're mm -hmm. alone in the universe so that we can go off world in a gazillion ton, bazillion, you know, beryllium starship, like McKenna used to say, is that really the way we do it? Do we just do it by consuming a plant and going to meet our ancestors or see another civilization? Mm -hmm. That absolutely resonates that you do it through the inner verse, you don't do it through the outer verse. 
And this is potentially one of the reasons for the Fermi paradox is that civilizations go inward rather than mm. outward. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well stuff said, like, beautifully like said. Yeah. You, you said it, yeah. And you could also say that those things technically are the same thing, which is like... You know, again, you can get caught. You can yeah. really spin your wheels. In, yeah, in. Yeah. It's hard to... It takes time to communicate things simply and effectively that are very... Difficult yeah. concepts. And this is why we have to break away from civilization and tune inward and spend lots of time alone to do these things. Tuning inward, that's another good just meme. Yeah, for tune, tune in. Tune inward. Tune inward. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, are we in a simulation? Interesting question. I would say if we are, it's not malevolent. It's just something that's a growth, it's a growth lab. Yeah. It's like a lab for souls to grow. Souls, tra souls transit here to grow, right? And then you go elsewhere to be like, what did you learn? And then how much did you discover? And, you get to a certain state where you evolve to a higher, higher density, right? So there's higher density beings that were once down here in this evolutionary place. Well, so, the, the overall game is not malevolent, but there is a malevolent uh, a component yes. to the simulation. Don't you know? Let's, for the kids, <laughs> I wouldn't put it in the malevolent box, but I'd yeah, say yeah. again, there are a malevolent things. That, there are malevolent forces at play, at and, play. You, and part of your growth is working beyond those. Yes. And, and, and that's really tough because it's like, well, how is, Niles, how does that apply to my life now with my problems? I'm having, I'm struggling with X, Y, Z. I haven't talked to my sister in, you know, three years. I struggle to pay rent. These very material, concretized problems. Again, structure your life so you have more time to, to look into things of excellence and not spend it with people that are energy vampires. Vampires. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. And the last question is, what is the most beautiful thing in the world? Conversations like this, buddy. You know, a space where you can have a real conversation is beautiful. I would say that when you wrap it up as well and you have people that, you know, are fond of you and remembered you and you had some ever so slight influence on bettering others, right? Service to others and not just service to self. You can only help yourself. You can't help others unless you help yourself, though. So it's like help yourself, get yourself good and straight and right, and then you can hopefully oh, yeah. do your ever so slight part in benefiting others. So that's, there's a beauty when you wrap it up whenever, you, whenever your time is and you've hopefully had benefit to others. And there's a, there's a line, I'll tell you one last thing. In the Corpus Hermeticum, which is a book of hermetic philosophy, there's a, there's a thing in it that says don't die without any children. And it doesn't mean physical children, it's encoded. <clears throat> Because again, we, we're communicated to by synchronicity and symbolism in the day and our dreams at night. We could have a whole other conversation about dreams, but children are those who we help along our journey. That's great. Right? So don't yes. die without helping others. helping others on their journey. It's not just like how you give them material totally. success, how totally. you help them in their journey, right? Yeah. So yeah. yeah, that's a piece of beauty. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've ever taken this many notes from a conversation before. Oh really, this man, that's been, great. Well, yeah. this has been super profound. Oh, really thanks, enlightening. I feel like I'm just on a whole nother level. You, Thank you. you. You should feel better after a conversation. And if you feel like you've had an interview that's gone rubbish or it's weird, or again, it's taken energy and you're just like, ah, I'm not sure about that. You should feel like pumped after the conversation. So I hope so that that's pumped. great. So yeah. pumped, yeah. Yeah. You crushed it. Oh, thank, thank you, man. Miles. Thank that you. Was such a pleasure. Such a pleasure. <laughs> and wow. we crashed. We crashed the network too. We crashed yeah, I the, uh, and we the mesh and, network. Ha! Ah, <laughs> wow. The, yeah, the fact. Right. Oh, will you teach us about the dark gatekeeper stream cuts? Smash. Yeah, it was crazy Smash. that that happened. Um, yeah. So. Huge thank you everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. Make sure to go and tune inward now as well. Go and uh, check out the links in the bio below to Niles' work. Check out nileshekman.com, transmutationfilm.com, as well as shamsoftheglobalvillage.com. Support artists and entrepreneurs like Niles here. Go and rent these, share them with your friends, get talking more about ancient wisdom in modern times. Go and do that, everyone. Let's get, let's get going towards what we talked about in the conversation today. And support simulation. Our links are below. Help us grow and prosper as well. Huge shout out to Ron Vagas for producing and directing. Thank you very much, Ronnie. And Thanks, Ron. Yes, and go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace.